you can talk to the sponsor, you can feel like you know them, you can feel like you trust them, but there's really just no way. They're gonna put their best foot forward, right? They're gonna tell you good things. But if you talk to someone who's been investing with them for a couple of years and you trust that person, then you can trust that if they've had a good experience, you'll likely have one too. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the Gentle Art of Crushing It show, where we focus on learning and sharing with our listeners all there is to know about how to create success in our lives. This show stands on the shoulders of giants. Our mission is to empower and inspire our listeners to create the life of their dreams whilst having a blast in the process. Let's celebrate life together. Welcome to the show. All right. Welcome back to the Gentle Art of Crushing It podcast, Passive Investing Edition. My name is Randy Smith, and I'll be your host today. And we have got a really exciting guest on the show today, Lee Yoder. Lee, welcome to the show. Yeah, Randy, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Awesome. Well, let's let's jump right in. Lee, can you kind of walk sure. us through your background and what you were doing before you found this amazing real estate investing space um, and take us through that journey to where you are today? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Uh, I like to tell my story, Randy, because... Um, you know, it's nothing uh, special. I think a lot of people, it's very relatable. Uh, people could follow my path if they want to. They could, you know, do some of the th same things that I did and, and um, throw out others. But um, anybody could get into real estate like I have because um, I'm a physical therapist by trade. Um, and, you know, so I went to school for a long time, um, got out, was was working an outpatient clinic, you know, where, where you or I, Randy, would go get physical therapy if we needed it. Um, got into home health. Uh, physical therapy where I drive around seeing mostly older folks in their homes. Uh, that job was great flexibility, uh, almost no stress for me. So my wife loved that job for me. Um, great for the family. Problem for me is I just, God did not create me for a job like that. Um, I was just very bored. It wasn't, you know, challenging or exciting. So it wasn't fulfilling. So the company I was with was actually a startup company, a startup staffing company. I was, you know, on with them. I came in the office as a clinical director. I ended up kind of moving more toward a director of operations role. I was doing sales. I was doing no therapy. So went to school for seven years, went to, you know, grad school. They make us get our doctorate now. Uh, so I had a doctorate and I'm not even using it. You know, I'm only like three years out of, out of all this school. Um, so some people think that's stupid, but I, I was making more money, um, do, doing this. So I, I don't know. It wasn't that stupid, but, um, that wasn't great either, Randy, because now I'm on the opposite side. I'm climbing the corporate ladder. Now I've got work that's challenging, exciting. It's very fulfilling work, but it's the opposite experience for my family where I don't have the flexibility. I don't have margin. So didn't like that either. So, you know, my wife and I, um, you know, we're just kind of reflecting and, and praying through that. And, and we, you know, I just got this spot, Randy, where I'm like, is this my option? Do I have to pick a job that's good for my family? But is like being stuck on an assembly line for me. I mean, that's how it felt. And that's being a little bit dramatic, but just not fulfilling work or, Hey, go do a job. that's fun and exciting and fulfilling for me, but it's not going to be great for my family. And it felt like that was the choice. And then, you know, found somebody hand me a self-development book and then a real estate book. And then I read rich, Store, rich dad, poor dad. And, and was like, okay, maybe there's a different way. So I started meeting with some people, met with a buddy from church that was doing real estate full time. And he said, Hey, can you, can you do your job from home? Can your job be more flexible? The answer for me, Randy was no. Um, and I like this part of my story because today more than ever, a lot of people can answer yes to that, right? Like more people than ever working from home. Cause his point was, if you want to get into real estate, if you want to do it on the side, you need more flexibility. You know, you, you need to be able to do that. And I would say, Randy, I, I think you'd probably agree. Even when you're getting into passive real estate investing, you almost need to pick it up kind of as a side hustle because you really need to be very active early on to learn and go to conferences and do a lot of that to make good decisions as a passive investor. But I wanted to do it actively. So that sparked my thinking to go, well, I'll go back to home health physical therapy. Yes, a job I don't really like, but now I've got real estate as a side hustle. So left in 2016, uh, flipped the house like so many people do. Uh, my wife's like, that's not passive investing. That's not what you told me investing was like. And I'm like, yeah, it's not. It's just a different job. But it got to start in real estate, got a duplex, rented that for a little bit, sold that, got into some small multis, had a property management company manage those, was like, this is much better. I like this better, but I want to go bigger. You know, had a 16 unit, eight unit, and 10 unit. Um, market took off, sold all those, gave me this big runway, this big cushion. Um, and I said, I'm going to leave my job. And if I don't do anything for three years, We'll be able to pay the bills, but then I'll just have to go back to my W-2. Uh, but I haven't looked back since then. And we've 
syndicated four deals since then, brought in more and more investors on the, on the little ones. Um, they weren't that little 16, eight and 10 unit stuff. Uh, Randy, we just did joint ventures. So just brought in one or two partners. It's a great way to get started. If you want to get into multifamily, I think that's the best way to get started. Uh, and what was really cool about that is Randy is like when we sold them, I made, I made really good money, but so did my partners. And it was, it was family and friends. And that was really cool to, to see other people benefit from, uh, the investments that we're doing. So that's why syndication really spoke to me. It's like, man, we can bring even more people like buy bigger properties. This makes sense. Really build more of a business, but also let more people benefit, uh, from the, from the power of multifamily investing, just commercial real estate in general. Uh, and that's what we've been doing ever since. Are you interested in real estate investing, but don't know where to get started or think you don't have the time or money? Are you stuck in your W-2 because the golden handcuffs make it hard to walk away? If this sounds like you, check out impactequity.net and schedule some time to talk with the founder, Randy Smith. Randy went from massive income to leaving his W-2 through passive income, and he can help you do the same. www.impactequity.net so I, I'm hearing this theme of flexibility and margin and really yeah. kind of designing your life in such a way that you have flexibility and margin, either yeah. one to spend time with, or ultimately the goal is to spend more time with family and have yeah, that flexibility yeah, sure. and margin around your entire life. But it sounds yeah. like you took some pretty difficult decisions to step away from potentially higher income or most yes. probably higher income yep. backwards to get that flexibility and to get the additional margin so you can start working on this on the space. So I, I'm curious as you're going through that phase, you know, the conversation with the wife must have been very, very interesting. You must have had really interesting conversations with your peers at work and potentially the leaders at work. What did what did that look like? How was that experience for you? Yeah, really good question. I think it's really important, Randy. If you want to invest passively, you have to have money. You have to have disposable income. You have to have extra money. And a lot of times, Randy, the first step to that is tightening the, the purse strings a little bit, you know, making some tough decisions. And fortunately, I have a wife who I thought I was frugal until I met her. I mean, she's awesome. So I'm really blessed that way. So yeah, Randy, we, I took about a 30% pay cut and my wife was not, she was PRN at the time as a, as an RN, as a nurse. Uh, but she eventually stayed home full time. We homeschool our kids. We do a hybrid homeschool program. So that, that was meaningful for me to take a 30% pay cut. But the, the good thing for us was we, we didn't need that extra income. So our lifestyle did not change at all because we've always spent far below our means. And what that meant for us, Randy, was that we had, the, the freedom, the, the margin, the ability to do that because taking a 30% pay cut did not change our, our lifestyle. Um, and then also we've, we've had extra income. We've saved up a lot of money to then go and put it into investments. And we did it actively. But again, if you want to do it passively, you need to save up $50,000. And a lot of times, you know, people only focus on playing good offense. And by that, I mean, making more money. But you got to play good defense too. And you, you know, you got to, you got to spend less. And so that was definitely the first part of our journey, Randy, that we were, that we did that. I mean, even as very young people, we were doing that. Even while I was in college and my wife was working, we were penny pinchers and we were able to save up a 20% down payment to go get our house and start building equity in our house. And by the time we were ready to invest, we had a ton of equity and used the home equity line of credit, but it was all those things. So yeah, that, that's kind of going back too far, Randy, but it's just, that is the first step is, is being in a position to do that. And the reason we were in a position to do that is because that 30% pay cut didn't, didn't mean, oh my gosh, my wife has to go back to work and we can't homeschool anymore. We got to send the kids to the, you know, free public school. And we didn't have to do that because we were, you know, in a good financial position. I, I love it. I love it. I think, I think phase one is get your financial house in order. Hands yeah. Down. yeah. You find a lot of people that come into the space and they're trying to make a quick buck, think they're going to get rich overnight and they're, you know, they're charging up credit cards, they're leveraging yeah. things they should not be leveraging in order to do that. So, um, you know, and then you, you hear a lot about this, you know, lifestyle creep that a lot of people, that a lot of people sure. talk about keeping up with the Joneses. I like the new phrase, when you st actually start making a lot of money, you want to keep up with the Cardones. And um, <laughs> it, it doesn't make sense. You know, to me, yeah. it doesn't make any sense. So um, I love the fact that you guys started with discipline in your finances from a, a very young age and we're able to to live below your means which seems like such common sense 
but the majority of the population has no idea how to do that or even what that yeah. even means. So, so great yep. job there. And you, you mentioned a lot about your kids and your family. I suspect there's, there's a lot of lessons that you're teaching your children as well that will translate to similar lifestyles for them in the future. So do you have yeah, any thoughts so. or ideas you want to share about how that impacts the kids and the household as a whole or? Yeah, we think about that a lot, Randy. It is difficult. Um, I will say like, you know, we're, we're, we're not wealthy yet, but like our kids don't need anything. They, I feel like they get everything they want um, from their grandparents, unfortunately. Uh, but so, you know, we, yeah, it's a tough thing. Um, I, I was telling my wife, like our kids got used to, we were like going to Florida every spring break. And I'm like, I don't want our kid. I mean, both of us were like, we don't want our kids to think they just get to go to Florida every spring break. But the problem is Randy, my wife and I kind of want to go to Florida every spring break. So, you know, that, that's a tough thing. So it, it is kind of tough. You know, our, our kids are, are pretty privileged. Um, and, and, and I don't really want them to, to need anything. Like I want them to have, you know, food, shelter, plenty of love, but, um, we try to do little things like when we go to our apartments, um, they're picking up trash. You know, I, I, we try to instill like, you're not above anything. We're not above anybody. We might own this building and the people here, you know, live in, in, in kind of our building that we own with our investors, but we're going to, we're out here to pick up trash. We're picking up their trash. So we're obviously not any better than them. We're in a different situation, doing different things. We are picking up their trash because they can't seem to make it into the trash can, um, into the, into the dumpster there at the end of the parking lot. So we're going to do it for them. Um, so just try to do things like that. You know, we, we kind of live a little bit in the country. We burn firewood. Uh, we don't need to do that. It does not save us any money. Um, it's a lot of work, but I like it because my kids have to bring in the wood and, and start fires. And it's like, if you want to, if you're cold, go, let's build a fire. You got to build a fire. So we just try to, it's almost like manufacturing some of those things because yeah, you know, I want to make a ton of money and I'm not going to like withhold all of it from my kids, but at the same time, I don't want them to be spoiled. So it is kind of tough. Uh, we do think about it a lot. I think in America for most people, that is kind of tough. So I don't know. We, we try to manufacture it in some ways. And, um, I think in some ways our kids have no idea how much money we have. I think they know they don't need anything. Um, sure. but yeah, hopefully they think we're poorer than we are. We have to work really <laughs> sure. hard. Yeah. Sure. That's what I sure. want to pass on to them. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you for walking through that. I, I just, I heard, I heard a lot about family and the kids and I figured there yeah. was some good stuff there, which there was. So we thank think about you. it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's talk if we can a little bit, um, uh, threefold real estate investment. So there's mm -hmm. got to be a story behind that name. Talk to me if you, you can about that. Yeah. So, uh, you've probably noticed so far. I mean, we're, we're Christ followers. Um, we, 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 that's first and foremost for us. So when we were building our business, um, not that it always has to be, um, for Christians or, or, or of another faith, but for us, we wanted that to kind of be out in front. We wanted to be, um, honest with people and, and maybe, maybe attract some of those people. Certainly we have a lot of people that, that partner with us that aren't, aren't Christians, maybe have different belief systems, but for us, that leads everything we do. So, um, you know, the, the, the threefold, you know, comes from, um, a, a verse in Ecclesiastes that talks about, you know, one man's not going to be able to stand alone. If you've got another, then two might be able to withstand against somebody, but a threefold cord is not easily broken. So for us, um, kind of just high level, that meant, you know, we've got the threefold, the company, uh, then our, our partner is our investors, you know, the people that, that, that partner with us and bring the capital. And then we always want God to be that third partner. And for us, Randy, you know, it kind of means different things in different situations, but overall, it's just, we like to say we have an eternal focus when it comes to our investing and just, to, you know, it's a long-term view. It's thinking about our residents a little bit differently, trying to serve them. We feel like God has placed these people in our lives for a reason. So we're wanting to, to really give back. And so as we think about the identity of the community that we're developing, we just want people to know that's what they're getting into. And, and we really try to give back a lot to our residents. Um, and, and a lot of our investors really like to see that and like to be a part of that. I know a lot of other groups do that as well. And so that, that's kind of what the name says is that that's, that's how we think about things and that's how we're going to operate. So if you want to be a part of the, this community, that's the kind of community you're joining. I love it. I love it. So, um, I hear, I'm hearing a lot about stewardship. Do you have thoughts yeah. about stewardship? Um, yes. I, cause my, my belief system is that, um, I believe God does want us to live an abundant life. Um, yeah. I oh, believe sure. that if we are good stewards of the things he blesses us with, then we will receive more, whether that be yeah. finances, health, relationships, whatever that might be. Um, and I think that actually transfers into, um, the passive investing space as well as being good yeah. stewards of the money that your investors give you as well. So I'm yep. curious your thoughts about that as well. Yeah. I think about this a lot too, uh, Randy, because 
for some reason, I've, I've just always had this fascination with money um, and, and, it, and it can be competition for Christ. So, you know, you've got to be careful. The Bible talks a lot about money and, and you got to be careful, but I do believe God has created me to want to build something and build a business. And, but you're right, Randy, it's all about, okay, but how am I going to steward that money when it, when it comes in? And, and now when we're partnering with our investors, we're, we're helping steward their money. Well, um, so yeah, we're trying to build a community that says, let's, Hey, yeah, Christians, I, I think we should absolutely, Randy, like you said, have an abundant mindset and, and there's nothing that says we, we shouldn't go make a whole bunch of money because how much good can we do with that? Again, Christian or not, I think you should think that way. I mean, let's, let's go make as much as we can. Also, one thing we love about real estate, Randy, is we try to give as little back to the government as we can. Let's keep it because we think we can do really good things with it. We don't think the government has, um, you know, they're, they're the only ones that can do, you know, good things with the money. Um, I, I think they're, you know, fraud and stuff there, whatever. Like we, we want to keep it. We want to go do good things. So yeah, I, I think, um, let's be good stewards with our talents and our time. And so with that, we're trying to generate as much as we can build wealth, be smart about it. I think investing in general is that idea that you and I talked about Randy already that we're trying to save money, trying to not spend it on frivolous things. So we have money to invest and then that can double and triple and quadruple. And then now we've got even more to invest, but also we've got enough to give to others. So yeah, I, I that's what I, I, I love investing for that reason. I, that for that reason, I think everybody should be involved in it, especially Christ followers who want to impact the world and, and give back like Jesus did. Um, we can do a lot of great things if, if we are good stewards of our money and make a lot more money. I love it. Love it. Thank you for going. Yeah, going down sure. I can tell there's some passion there. So yeah, definitely. Well, let, let's kind of shift, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, this multifamily space that both you and I are, are very excited about. Why did you choose multifamily or was it just kind of natural progression? You know, two is better than one and four is better than two. Like, talk to me about that. Yeah, yeah. So um, my introduction to real estate, Randy, it was it was right into kind of residential, you know, flip a house. And so I guess I never thought about like industrial um, self-storage retail, anything like that. And I, I just say that because I think I'm I'm pretty bullish on almost all real estate long term. I, I think it's all good stuff. But you know, started with the house and then, and, and my dad's in construction. So, so many things with, with real estate just spoke to me, but you started with the house and then really Randy, it was like, it was listening to podcasts like yours and hearing more and more people come on, you know, listen to the bigger pocket stuff back, you know, back in the day when I was getting started and just hearing so many people talk about economies of scale and going bigger and here's the benefits. And so I just always had that in my mind. Um, and again, I, I told you, I mean, we flipped one house and Right away, my wife was like, this is not what you said real estate was like, right? So, yep, this isn't investing. It's another job. Again, I, I don't, I don't want to squash it because it's a great way to get started. Um, and you do learn a lot about real estate. You, you meet with contractors, things like that. But immediately we jumped into the duplex. Uh, the thing with that, Randy, the lesson was one, we managed it. We didn't like managing it. We had great residents. They were easy. We still didn't like it. We just didn't like that kind of burden, that stress. So we knew we wanted third party management. Um, that's harder to do with small properties. Um, you can just imagine, I mean, just, you should do it yourself a little bit because I started to realize like this duplex is easy, but I can't find any other, this was in our hometown. I can't find any other hometown. So I'm going to find them all over the place. So I'm going to have these duplexes scattered all over the place. The other piece of that, Randy is this duplex is making me like, I don't know, four grand a year. Um, I want to make 20 times that a year, at least just to cover my expenses. Do I want 20 duplexes scattered all over the place? No. So the economies of scale of like, do I want to own 20 duplexes all over Cincinnati and Dayton? No, that'll be really hard to manage for me. I don't want to do it. Even for third-party management, it'll be hard for them to do it. So that means two things, Randy. One, it's going to be expensive. Two, they're still not going to do a very good job. So for those reasons, it made sense. And again, I didn't know this from experience at the time, but I heard enough guys and girls talking about it. And then just seeing it just a little bit was like, yeah, this makes sense. And so we go and get a 16 unit that's still small, still too small to have somebody on site, which today I don't like. I like having somebody on site. Uh, we can get into that, but still uh, was able to use the third party management. A 16 unit can afford that a little bit better than a duplex. It's at least, that's eight duplexes under one roof, right? So just moving in that direction. Uh, once we partnered with a professional third party management, saw what they could do versus what we could do. It was like, we're never going back. Um, and just, yeah, growing from there, Randy, just seeing like, man, 16 under one roof is way better than eight, but what if we could get 50? What if we could get a hundred? Once we get that hundred unit mark, Randy, we had somebody on site for the first time that 
light bulbs going off. Yep. I, I see what everybody's talking about. Right. Like again, not only does a hundred units afford the property management better and, and, and can afford a person on site, but that person on site, just, it changes everything. We've got a girl on site, a couple, you know, girl at one property, girl, at another, and that's their whole focus, Randy. It just, it, it, it changes everything. They, that's their baby. They own it. They crush it. Um, so yeah, just little steps along the way. You can see why people keep moving up, um, into the bigger stuff. It, it just makes sense from a, for me, it's property management. You've got to be able to manage the property. Well, and the bigger you go, the easier it is, I think. Okay. Yeah, no, that, yeah. that's awesome. And so today the portfolio, what does it look like? Yeah. So we're not, we're not all there yet. So we got a 45 unit. That was the first, uh, uh, syndication that we did, but it's actually a 29 unit and two eight units. So okay. then the next one we got was a 47 unit all under one roof. And then we okay. got a 95 unit and then a 96 unit. So, um, right. today we'd like to keep doing more of those. I'll, I'll say Randy, this is just a little side note. Uh, this is more for people being active, but when you get over hundred units, there's bigger competition. So uh, you can, I, I say, I just want hundred, 150, but it's stiffer competition. So we've sure. kind of found this nice niche of, you know, 90 to hundred, maybe 110. Um, yep. so we'd love to just keep doing more and more of those, but, um, where yep. we can put somebody on site. And, and as you build scale with, you know, two forties next door to each other, that's just like yes. having an 80, right? Yeah. So yep. you're 96 yep. and you're 30, it's the same thing. So for sure. Yes. Yeah, I love that idea. Sense. Yep. Okay. Great point. So you are in the Midwest, um, yep. and being a guy who's in the Sun Belt. Um, you probably get really, really sick of hearing people talk about how wonderful the Sun Belt is in regards to not only the weather, not to like poke and prod there. But yeah, yeah. Also, I like cold weather. So that doesn't okay. Me. I like cold okay, weather. Okay, perfect. perfect. So, um, <laughs> yeah. But there's a big difference between investing in the Sun Belt and investing yeah. in the Midwest. So yep. talk about that a little bit. We haven't got into that a lot on this show yet, but I'd love for you to kind of help educate the audience about the benefits. Yeah. Yeah. From a high level, the one thing I'd say, Randy, is like, I don't argue with people. I mean, I'm a math guy, a numbers guy. I'm not going to argue about population growth, uh, job growth, you know, so, and, and then therefore those things drive appreciation and rent growth. I am not going to argue that uh, Phoenix blows away Cincinnati, uh, at least before maybe the past six months or so. We'll, we'll see what happens going forward. But um, yeah, I, I, I've not, I've not tried to argue those things in the past five, 10, 15 years, whatever. It's been a great run um, for those cities. What I'll say, Randy, is like, that's priced in, you know, it's not a secret, at least it hasn't been for the past five years or whatever. So to me, it's a little bit like saying, well, why would you buy this stock? And I, I can't think of a name that would be a good example. Why wouldn't you just buy Amazon stock? Amazon's the best. Okay. Yeah. Duh. Everybody knows that. And Amazon stock is priced accordingly, right? So what's the upside for Amazon? Now, again, has you maybe I would have said that five years ago, Randy in Phoenix and Phoenix has, you know, just continued on a tear in Austin and all, all the rest. Right. So I get that. And what I would say, Randy is like, there's a place for both. Um, again, like I, like I was saying earlier, I'm, I'm all in a multifamily. That's all I'm going to do actively, but I absolutely want to in, invest in industrial and self storage, um, mobile home parks passively. I think they're all great. So I'm not, I'm not here to bash anyone. I'm just telling you, I got into multifamily and I'm just going to stick with that because I'm not smart enough to do more than one at a time. And I, and I would just say that about markets. Um, I invest in Cincinnati and Dayton because I live here. I do think it's a good market. I mean, if I lived in California, I wouldn't say I invest in California because I live here because I would not invest in California. But that's why I invest here. And the goal, Randy, for me would be to get stuff going here and have a, enough of a team and enough of portfolio that I can also go invest in appreciation markets. Um, now, I think timing matters more in appreciation markets. I will say you know, maybe it's a little bit different this time, but markets like Phoenix and Austin and, and Seattle and San Fran, I mean, they run up the best and they run down the worst, right? So timing matters, but if we can hit that timing right, I would love to invest in, in Phoenix when, when the timing's right. But what I've just said over the past is like, sure, I'll look at a property in Phoenix, but like I, and, and I just don't understand the market. Like I don't understand paying 300 grand per unit because no one would do that here, but we don't get the same rent. So I don't understand it that well, but yeah, that's what I would say. It's just, it's priced in. So just be careful just because everybody's moving to Phoenix and everybody needs a place to live. That's fine, but it doesn't mean they have to pay 2,500 or 2,000 or whatever. Right. So 
just be careful. That's, that's what I would say here in the Midwest. We don't have the population growth. Fine. We also don't build as many units. Like it, it, it all balances itself out. So, you know, we, we buy at different cap rates, but we sell at different cap rates. So, right. Like we're going to, people say, you know, there's a lot of people on bigger pockets or whatnot that said, oh my goodness, like I'm interested in Dayton and Cincinnati because we can buy at a seven cap. Okay. That that's right. We, you, you can, you can find some deals. You're also going to sell at a seven cap. So just keep that in mind. Right. So, um, in, in Phoenix, oh gosh, we have to buy at a five cap. Well, and you're going to sell at a five cap. I mean, all things being equal. Right. So, it's just different markets, man. I, I think do both is what I would say. I, I I encourage people to do both or look at both. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I think the one thing you and I discussed early on is that cash flow, like year one cash flow as a passive investor will likely be better in a Midwest market than it will be in uh, a Sunbelt because yeah. there's not much being, not as much being factored in for the appreciation play in the Midwest. So yeah, um, yep. And, and I yep. think that's from a diversification standpoint um, and also understanding as an investor what your needs are. So sure. do yeah. you need to turn $500,000 uh, in, in an a, a nest egg into X amount of dollars? Are you able to do that better in a Midwest market or are you better to do that in a Sunbelt market? Um, and if you're a growth investor, is it better to put those dollars in the Midwest or in the South? Um, so yep. I, I think understanding your strategy and knowing your needs and then aligning it with the right operator in the right market is really the key. So, uh, um, yeah, well said. So I'm, I'm curious too. Um, we talked about timing, of course. Um, everybody knows that interest rates are playing all kind, wreaking all kinds of havoc in the space. Sure. Um, yep. What is, what is that doing to your business model? Are you, were you primarily value add that was leveraging bridge loans or are you doing some of these mid range loans, seven, 10 year loans? What, how is that impacting your business today? Yeah. The, the, the way it's impacted us, Randy, is that I haven't bought anything since last May and it's driving me nuts because, um, you know, as you know, it just, uh, the interest rates going up, make it so that I can offer less. Uh, and, and buyers aren't willing to come down that much. So there's a, a bid ask spread, right? There's a difference between what the sellers, I mean, you know, I, I have a perfect example for you, Randy. We had a, a deal that we did offer on last spring when rates were in the high threes here, um, low fours, and we offered 3.15 million. And then he wouldn't take it. He almost did. Uh, it was a, it was a, uh, 53 unit right across from our 95 unit. I wanted it so bad. He wouldn't take it. He ended up listing it in the fall of 22, uh, at 3.4. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I don't, necessarily know if the broker's telling me true, but he, he sold it somewhere between two, nine and three. So under what we had offered, but our offer was all the way down at two, seven, five, Randy. And it, again, just because of the interest rate, just because the bank is taking so much more of the money that I can't offer you 3.1 like I could, because before the bank was taking so much less. And so I had more for my investors, but now that the bank is taking so much more, I can only give you two, two, seven, five, because I got to have enough for my investors. Right. Cause like you said, Randy, if you invest in the Midwest, People expect an 8% preferred return, so we got to give it to them. So that's what it's doing to me mostly. We, we um, fortunately, in all of our deals, we have fixed rate debt um, at least five years. Uh, our worst loan is 4.375% fixed for five years. Uh, most all, all the rest of our loans are in the threes. Um, so yeah, no no risk there. We, we've just been, uh, you know, they're, they're smaller deals, so we've uh, used... Um, General Electric Credit Union on, on three of them here in Cincinnati and uh, just great five-year fixed, fixed interest rate. So, um, you know, we would just get like a year interest uh, interest only on those. They give us um, 80% loan to value, uh, give us 80% uh, on the on the um, rehab. Now, that's that's changed, Randy, too. Not only is it our interest rate, but a lot of times uh, you're not getting 80%, you're getting 75 or, or, or 70, right? So um, at least 75 on those. So again, I can't offer as much then because I got to get more, um, you know, uh, private capital for my investors. And that's more expensive than the bank. Uh, even, even when the bank's at six, you know, my investors still want more than that. So, um, yeah, fortunately our, our current portfolio really hasn't been affected at all, but it's making it hard to, to buy anything. Sure. <laughs> and you're sitting on the sidelines, just jonesing for the next deal. So, um, yes, I, I think we're going to see some changes, uh, hopefully in the next six months or so that hopefully we'll lighten that up for you a little bit. And I, I think so. we're going to see a lot of stuff come on the market with folks that were using bridge loans. Yeah. You know, kind be. of the standard talk that we're hearing a lot about now. So, yep. um, certainly going to be more opportunity in the future. So I, I'm curious as a, as a kind of a, a mid-sized operator, 
you're not a, a small, small guy, but you're not one of the big guys yet. Sure. How do you, um, how do you talk to your investors about the benefits of working with a group like yours versus one of these billion dollar owners, billion dollars under assets under management groups that kind of have this cookie cutter, you know, yeah. um, this process where they can just pick things up, they go through the cookie cutter um, business model and then spit out, you know, very good returns on the back end. So how, how do you compete yeah. with that? How do you talk about that with your investors? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think um, I would advocate Randy, that it, that the sponsor that you should bet on the jockey, not the horse. Um, and, and so, but that's still what you're saying. You're saying like, man, yeah, but these jockeys over here, they have way more experience and, you know, won a lot more medals a hundred percent. So, um, but I would just say most of our investors so far, they know me. Um, I think that's a little bit di this different. I mean, I am totally the one running the, the, the show. Um, I've got some, you know, people that help me and, and, and some other people on the team, but um, I'm, you know, the head of the company and, and all of our investors have easy access to me because we're just small. So we won't maybe always be like that, but that is the one benefit. Um, we invest in our own backyard. I'm the one also going out to the property. I mean, they see videos of me out at the property. They, they, they know that I'm the one that's on the weekly call with the property manager every week. So some people like that. Um, again, I, you know, that's actually not my goal to do that, um, forever. So I'm not going to bash the guys that don't do that. If you've got a team to do that and the guy at the top is not doing that, that's great. Um, but there is a benefit to that. And for right now, that's the benefit that we have is that, uh, we're very hands-on, um, and you have access to me. So if you want to know, like, and trust the guy running it, you probably have a better chance of doing that with a smaller company like us than, than with the big one. So I think that's, that's what it is. We, you know, we, we live here, we grew up here, so we know the market. Well, maybe some of the bigger players, like they're investing all over the country. So you may feel like, man, do you really know all those markets and stuff like that? We're, we're very local. Um, and that's just easier for a smaller company to do. I love it. Yeah. yeah. No, and, and I think, I think there's a lot to be said about the operator that bought the duplex, bought the quad, bought the 10, mm -hmm. the six, the 18, and, you know, gradually grew. And like you have been involved in every single aspect of this business sure. from yeah, day one. So, yeah. you know, fast forward five, seven, 10 years down the road, when you're doing the two and three and 400 unit apartment complexes um, or whatever you've done with yourself, you've been through that entire journey and yeah. you've got an expertise that the guy who, you know, spent 50 grand on a mentorship program and went out and yeah, took down 150 sure. unit day one, like I would much rather have my money with you than some guy who's coming off a weekend event and, and a, a notebook of notes, you know? So, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, cool. Well, clearly you're doing a very, very good job. Your investors continue oh, to bring dollars back to you. Um, you're clearly very, very passionate about this, which I love. Yeah. I love, yeah. love that the business is, is um, the foundation is on principles and morals and values that I, I absolutely can align with. And oh, I'm sure yeah, that, we try to be. Yeah, see, and clearly that resonates with your investors as well. So, yeah, well, let's so. let's do this. We're you know here we are, thirty minutes, and I still have fifteen questions, but <laughs> I think we'll we'll have to move to um, kind of to wind this down a little bit. But sure. I, I'm curious are there are there any final thoughts you'd like to share to um, very specifically to the new passive investor who might be a little nervous about making that first fifty thousand dollar wire or yep. um, their fir very first place play in the real estate space. Any advice to that investor? Yeah. My biggest piece of advice, Randy, is to network with other passive investors. I just, I don't think, you know, I guess from my, when I was looking at property management companies to partner with, there was just, uh, there was no way for me to really know what it would be like to work with any of the property management companies. Cause I had never worked with any of them. The only, the best option was to go talk to people that had worked with them and had worked with them for a while you know, for more than a year and really new. And if I trust that operator and that operator says, I've been working with this property management company for two years and they're not perfect, but they're the best, then I'm going to go with them. And so I would say the same thing for a passive investor, find some other people that you know, like, and trust hopefully, and say, who are you investing with? Who's been a good experience? Um, you know, you and I were talking about the, the left field investors group out of, out of Columbus. And that, that's what that group was born out of. It's just a bunch of passive investors that get together that say, Hey, I'm interested in investing with this group. It'd be great if I could talk to some people. Well, that's what that group is. Like, it's a big enough group that probably a couple of people in that group have invested with them. And so you got to talk to them because there's just no way 
you can talk to the sponsor, you can feel like you know them, you can feel like you trust them, but there's really just no way they're going to put their best foot forward, right? They're going to tell you good things. Um, but if you talk to someone who's been investing with them for a couple of years and you trust that person, then you can trust that if they've had a good experience, you'll likely have one too. I love it. Yeah, it, it's such a good point. I think, you know, if if passive investors are hanging around and three or four or five people mention that Lee Yoder did a great job for them, like yeah. odds are Lee Yoder's going to do a pretty good job for you as well. Yeah. Right, and, right. and I suspect if you get a good referral from them on that, they probably know good CPAs. They probably know good yep. tax strategists. Yep. They probably know yeah. good, you know, so like just finding one key player in any given market, any given industry, that could lead to so many other connections sure. that are going to bring value, which, and you're, you're doing that in your business clearly because you don't grow the way that you've grown if you're not, if you're not working with good partners. So yeah, um, yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Really, really good advice. Thank you for that. Um, I'm curious. Are there any particular, like, are there podcasts or books that you would suggest to the, the newer passive investor? Maybe not like, um, you know, details of economics and trends yeah. and things like that, but like something, something the new passive investor could learn and, and take a lot of value from. I'll give you a book, the, the hands off investor by Brian Burke. I think yeah. that's a good one. A lot of people talk about that one. Um, I, I have a, I have a coach um, and he told me to read it as an active guy. He's like, you read this. He's like, cause I think all passive investors should read this. So you should read it because you should know the questions that they're going to, you know, and, and, and everybody should read. It. I think that's a really good one for passive investors to read. Awesome. Any any particular podcast, of course, other than than this one that you would suggest? Yeah, other than this one, um, man. Uh, I don't know. You know, I'll I'll say Left Field Investors podcast. Um, yep. Because that one's so focused on passive investors, uh, and I don't know too many that are. Um, again, you, you know, yeah, you're that's what you're focusing on, Randy. That's why it's great. I mean, I would, yeah, I would go to the podcast that focus on passive investing because um, oh. so many of the other ones, it's really so many of the podcasts are really for people that are wanting to get started actively. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I would search for, yeah. you know, this one and maybe left field investors, ones that are focused more on passive investors. Love it. Yep. No, really. Um, Jim Pfeiffer and the group at left field investors are just amazing. I've gotten so much value from that, from that organization, from that community, good, yeah. from the sponsors that they, they sign off as, as well. So really, really good. Okay. Well, one final question here that I like to ask all guests and it's, it has nothing to do with uh, real estate. Maybe it does. Um, we'll see, but is there one bucket list item that you've recently checked off your bucket list or is there something that you're hoping to check off in the near future? Um, good question. So, uh, maybe not something super specific. So my kids are just now getting old enough where they can camp and my wife and I both love to, to travel and camp and go to national parks. So, um, we took them up, uh, last year gosh, maybe it's been a year and a half ago, but we went up Northeast. So we went up into the Finger Lakes region of, of New York and then upstate New York. And they hiked like their first mountain. Uh, it was called Mountain Joe. We get to the top and they were so proud of themselves. We were proud of them. We got this incredible view and it was so much fun. And we were tent camping out there. So that was kind of a, a family bucket list. Um, so now we're getting them more and more excited about going to national parks and stuff like that. They're young enough to still like it. I'm sure when they're teenagers, they'll, they'll hate it. But for now, we're going to eat that up. So the next bucket list, um, Randy, would be to do more of that and like to go out west. I mean, probably, um, so my daughter's in third grade. I don't know if you, you knew this and your listeners do this, but when, you're, when you have a kid that's in fourth grade, the whole family for the whole year can get into every national park for free for the whole I'm year. I'm not kidding. I had yes. no idea. Yeah. I know. It's a really neat, all, nationwide. So my daughter when so come this August, um, when she starts her fourth grade year for the whole year, we can get into national park. So not this summer, but next summer, I think we, we're, we're gearing up to do like the, you know, some people in the Midwest do like, we're going to do the whole out West. Like we'll, we'll go up North, you know, go through those, come down through, you know, you guys down there, um, yeah. and, and come back and, and do like the, the, you know, month long trip. Uh, that's a love bucket list item for sure. And hit up a bunch of national parks and we get into all of them for free. Love it. Love it. Love yeah. it. You're bringing, you're bringing value in areas. Yeah. I have no idea we'd even get to. Yep. So that's, that's awesome. Well, very that's good. Free of charge. That's free of charge there. Just a little bonus tip for you. Love it. Love it. Love it. Well, Lee, it's been, it's been a lot of fun um, learning and hearing about your, your experience and your journey. Um, you've brought just a ton of value to the audience. Um, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Yeah. So much. It's been a pleasure, Randy. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. All right. And to our listeners, as always, uh, you know, we continue to or we, we actually um, encourage you to continue to get educated, get inspired in the space. 
um, get in, get educated up to the point where you do make the decision to invest in that first deal. Once you do invest in that first deal, we're so confident that you'll be putting more and more of your capital in this space and ultimately find either work optional or decrease your dependence on your W-2. So um, we look forward to having you on the podcast again. And thank you so much for listening today. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of The Gentle Art of Crushing It. It was an amazing episode. We know we sure learned a lot, and we hope you did as well. We want to take a second and thank you so much for viewing or listening to this episode. And please just know that we only ask for one favor, and that is to make this life magnificent. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.